بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله I think it goes without saying that it's a great honor and a great privilege to be included in this blessed assembly. And while I feel humbled at being requested to speak at this gathering, because among you are many luminaries that I look up to and that I would much rather listen to than give any talk about anything, I'm here because I believe in the mission of Miftah. The Abdullah brothers or the Wahid brothers, I call them the Abdullah brothers, because I'm always in correspondence with Sheikh Abdullah. Um, whenever I think about them, I think about a pure passion for da'wah. Every time I talk to them, their sole concern is imparting the knowledge of deen to our community and making it accessible to people. And I would almost feel derelict in my responsibility as their brother to leave them stranded in that effort, to leave them marooned in that effort. So I'm here at their request. I want to express great gratitude for everyone that has presented this evening, including our dear brother Osama Sayyid, who came up and performed and I want you all to recognize that it takes great courage to offer what you have artistically in front of an audience that you can feel might be somewhat ambivalent about your performance. And our artists are not just a decorative addition or some unnecessary accoutrement to our religious programming. This is something absolutely essential. Al-Munshid Mu'allam, the poet is a teacher. This is like cliff notes. This is like the abridged version of what we're attempting to offer this evening. Now the topic that I was assigned to speak about was the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for Lady Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And I think in selecting that topic, the organizers of this program are drawing our attention to something important that is often neglected by people of high religious aspiration. You see, people of high religious aspiration are often seeking a connection with transcendence. They want to feel what some philosophers of religion call this numinous awe before the ineffable. But when you want to feel that, sometimes you forget the significance of what happens in your day-to-day -day life, your everyday quotidian reality. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, he is the Nabi of the Isra and the Mi'raj, but he is also the Nabi of he is the prophet of the night journey and the ascension, but he is also the prophet of, I have not been sent except, and for you students of Arabic, this is hasr, for no other reason than to perfect noble traits of character. These two foci, or these two focuses of religious folks I saw them in one dars. We were sitting with the sheikh and we were studying aqidah and we came to the chapter on the kharq al -ada, which is literally a break in the natural chain of events. When this break happens at the hands of a prophet, we call it a mu'ajizah. When this break happens at the hands of someone righteous, we call it a karama. When this break happens at the hands of someone wicked, we call it istidraj. But we didn't make it that far in the lesson. We only got to mu'ajizat and karamat. 
And when the Shaykh was talking about mu'ajizat and karamat, there was a sister in the auditorium waving her hand almost violently trying to get his attention. And when he asked her to speak, she said, Shaykh, before my Islam, I was a witch. Everybody in there gasped at the same time, like, what? And she said, I attended a conference in Geneva, Switzerland of witches and warlocks. A warlock is the male equivalent of a witch. I learned that at the conference. I didn't know that before. And she said the highest ranking member of our assembly, when he wanted to change positions in the room, he would just levitate from one place to another. And when she said that, I was thinking the same thing that you're thinking right now. You have to check the expiration date on your guacamole. And then she gave her disclaimer. She said, I have never experimented with hallucinogenic drugs. I have no history of mental illness, no external stimuli, nothing like this. I saw this with my own eyes. And this man was not a righteous person. How could he do that? And the sheikh said to her, if you go out to the airport, you'll see people flying around all over the place. That doesn't impress me. What impresses me is istiqama, uprightness, character, integrity, dignity. These are the things that are drawn into sharp relief by marriage. Nothing will test you like relationships. And this is with all of your relatives, all of your family members. You know, a friend of mine, he said, if you find that you are disillusioned with something, you should ask yourself, why did I have any illusion about this in the first place? Marriage is difficult. Marriage is hard. Family is difficult. So when we look at the love and the marriage of the Prophet وسلم, to any of the women to whom he, he was married, you see the grandeur of his character in a place that character is sometimes hard to display. So when they came to say the Aisha, radiallahu anha, and they said, give us an epitaph, give us a summary of the character of the Prophet والسلام, she said, his character was the Quran. He was the Quran walking on the earth. The thing that amazes me about this, this is the way that his wife could speak about him. You see, if somebody is praising me, if I look at my wife, she's smirking like this. There must be someone else named Ubaidullah Evans. But when you look at the integrity, the character of the Prophet ﷺ, everything about his story with Lady Khadijah expresses that character very, 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 very vividly. If we look at the way that they were wedded, even before Islam, her nickname was At-Tahira, the pure. She was known for her character. She was also very wealthy. She was strikingly beautiful. She was known to be upright, known to be unfailingly generous. She was a tahira And the Prophet ﷺ was al amin known to be trustworthy, known to be honest, known to be a peacemaker, a mediator. And he was not initially a merchant, he was a shepherd. The Prophet ﷺ actually said that all of the NBA, all of the NBA were shepherds. Because being a shepherd is a very good preparation for working in da'wah and tarbiyah. Because you can't move any faster than the sheep move. So it teaches you patience. And Khadijah was being burned in business. By the age of 25, 
This was a woman that had already been widowed two times, had lost both of her parents, and she was one of the wealthiest women in all of Meccan society. Some people called her Sayyida Nisa al Quraysh, the leader of all of the women of Quraysh. And she was looking for someone trustworthy to operate, to manage her caravan in, a, in, a, in an arrangement of Mudaraba. And her sister, Hala, told her about the Prophet ﷺ, that he shepherds my goats. And she went to Abu Talib and she said, would he have any interest in leading some trade caravans for me? And her caravans would sometimes number into one 800 camels. We're talking serious levels of wealth. And the Prophet ﷺ, not only did he manage her caravan, he doubled her holdings. And Maysara, a servant who was sent to assist the Prophet ﷺ, he saw that a cloud followed the Prophet ﷺ wherever he went. He saw his character. He saw that he was a monotheist. And he went back and told Khadijah, and she had experienced this increase in her profitability. So she was talking to Nafisa, a friend of hers. We have to learn the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And Nafisa could see the twinkle in her eye when she was talking about the Prophet ﷺ. And she said, you know, it's always a good sister that's doing some matchmaking. Where would we be without matchmaking sisters? Why don't you propose to him? And Khadijah, very wary about marriage at this time in her life. She is already a woman of 39 or 40 years. She said, I, I don't even know if he would be interested. And so Nafisa goes to the Prophet, والسلام, why don't you ever get married? Why don't you think about marriage? He said, I would, but I have a huge family to support. The Prophet والسلام, Abu Talib was very endeared to him. And Abu Talib, he was a mukarram man. He was an honorable man, but he was not a wealthy man. And the Prophet والسلام, was consumed with his domestic responsibility to the household to whom he belonged, to which he belonged. And then Nafisa said, what if someone wanted to marry you and money wasn't an issue for them? This was a person with grace, elegance, good character, wealthy. The Prophet ﷺ said the obvious, who? That's what I would say. Right? I always joke. I don't care how modest a person pretends to be, marriage shows how we really think about ourselves. Every time I tell a brother, yeah, there's a sister, she's looking for a good brother, strong in his dean, committed to his family, every brother perks up, yep, that's me. And then after that, he calls himself the fakir and talks about how he's, you know, one kessel on the but she's looking for a strong brother, me, me. The prophet said, who? She said, Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and the Prophet والسلام, accepted her proposal and they were married in a very simple ceremony without pomp and circumstance. Sallallahu alayhi, sallu ala habibikum. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam initially worked, not for her because now he's her husband, but it was clear that the social better in that relationship was definitely Khadijah al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha. Every time we studied the seerah together, my wife always asked me, Ubaidullah, could you work for me? I say, absolutely not. That's just a, an extension of your fragile male ego. Perhaps. But I don't think that I could. But this is something that we see that I think we should strive to emulate in the Prophet alayhi he didn't have any of those hangups. He didn't have any insecurity about who he was or what he was as a man. And this is why he was never abusive, never violent, never angry. One of my teachers said, everything you read about the Prophet in marriage, you see that he was not responding 
from an endangered place of masculinity. It was a secure place of masculinity, you see? And this is why she has more money than me, no problem. See, she's more socially prominent than I am. That's no problem, right? When she was asked by the Prophet why did you marry me? She said, because of the goodness of your character, and the truthfulness of your speech. This was the basis of the Prophet leadership among his family. Not that I have more money than you, or I'm socially more prominent than you. Or people hold me in higher esteem than they hold you. No, no. He led with his character. This is exemplary. This is something we should repeat in our circles. You want siyada? You want leadership? This is what leadership consists of. Walirrijali alayhinna daraja. Men have a rank over them. Ibn Abbas and his tafsir, it's a rank of service. Not a rank of sayyidara. Not a rank of domination. It's a rank of service. So moving forward, like they gave me, I think, 30 minutes. And anyone who knows me, they know I can't spell my name in 30 minutes. Just looking at some snapshots from their life together. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 25 years old when he married Khadija, radiallahu anha, and she was 40. When he received revelation 15 years after that, and they had a joyous domestic life, six children. There's, in all of the books that I read, there was only one argument between them, that she wanted him to attend like a family gathering. And he said, I will never worship Allah. I will never worship Uzza. And she said, Khalli bil alat wal Uzza. Like, forget alat wal Uzza. Like, don't, don't worry about that. That was the only disagreement that I can find in recorded text that they ever had. Right? But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received revelation, even before he received revelation, Aisha, radiallahu anha, narrating the hadith, she said that tahannuf, being alone, being in seclusion, became endeared to him. And sometimes he would spend days in Hira, sometimes weeks in Hira, sometimes an entire month in Hira. So much so that some people began to say things about Khadija. You changed his social station? Him marrying you was a major come up for him? And now he's abandoning you to meditate? Like, just contemporize that for a minute. My wife changes my life through marriage. And now I'm in a cave somewhere meditating and I'm not spending time with her. If you know my wife, that's not going to go over well. Khadijah was still coming to the Prophet, right? And they lived near Marwa, walking to Hira and then hiking up Hira, even now with the paved, like, path, it might take an hour and a half to get up there. She's coming up there bringing the Prophet ﷺ food, bringing him vittles, bringing him blankets, bringing him refreshments. She was always supportive of him. She never doubted him. So when he had that experience with the angelic, you know what I find absolutely breathtaking? Is that the first person that he thought to go to for comfort and consolation was not his best friend, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. It wasn't Abu Talib, a father figure to him. It wasn't Ali, someone very close to him, like a younger brother almost. It wasn't Hamza, like an older brother almost. It was Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And when he doubted himself, she affirmed him. He said, I'm, I'm afraid for myself. And she said, No way. No way. God would never dishonor you. Now I asked myself, 
What does my wife need to know about me? That if I come to her describing an experience for which she has no analog, no frame of nothing in her frame of reference, she would actually affirm me and say, you're not crazy. God would never dishonor someone like you. You stay in relationship with your relatives. You take care of the needy. You look after people that have burdens. Man, this is love. This is what love really looks like. I'll say this, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet because we don't have enough time to really go into this in the depth that it demands. One of the things I worry about in our community is that we're not doing enough to incentivize marriage. You know, I remember one brother. This is around the time that Black Panther, the movie, came out. He said, the reason I'm not married is because married people just aren't selling the institution of marriage. He said, whenever you ask them, how is married life? How's the family? They respond with something tepid and lukewarm, like, oh, it's okay. You take the bitter with the sweet. What can you do? He said, but the same people, when I ask them about Black Panther, they're ebullient. They're overflowing with, it was amazing. It was life changing. He said, if you're more excited about Black Panther than marriage, I'll just go to the theater. But when you think about marriage, don't think about it as just fulfilling a religious obligation. Think about it as a process through which you open yourself to this level of companionship. This level of service to another person. This level of identification with another person. And that is a kind of healing, a kind of cure for our egocentric natures. That I have to learn to care for someone that deeply, learn to support someone that deeply, learn to consider someone that deeply. And this will Make your relationship with Allah blossom. So I don't think it is a coincidence that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a harrowing moment of great consternation was seeking Khadija and seeking her embrace. Zammiluni, zammiluni. Right? Cover me, embrace me. Some brothers, even as this is from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the authenticity of these stories is beyond any doubt. The veracity, not even in question. Some of us were still uncomfortable with that level of male vulnerability. I said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, brothers like this. I don't know if I can. I don't know. No, this is what, this is what love looks like. This is what companionship looks like. I'll say this in closing. And I know every speaker, they say, I'll say this in closing. And then they go on for 40 more minutes. You know, it's like a, a preacher that goes and puts his watch on the rostrum. That watch doesn't mean anything. He's going to be talking and talking. Right? Don't give a child a telephone and don't give a preacher a microphone. Say that Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said that, she was jealous of Khadija, although she had never met Khadija. And one day, that jealousy seized her. And she said, why do you hanker after this old toothless Qurayshi woman when Allah has given you someone much better than that? And she said the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed like it would change when Wahi was descending upon him. And he sat for a long time and he didn't speak. 
but he lowered his eyes. And when he spoke, he said, when everybody said I was a liar, she believed in me. And she spent her fortune in service of Islam. By Allah, Allah has never given me better than her. And she said that whenever the Prophet ﷺ slaughtered an animal, he would say, Arsilu ila asti Khadija. Send some to the friends of Khadija. That sometimes when she, when he heard Hala's voice, he would perk up because her voice reminded him of the voice of Khadija. Right? This is love. And any of us that think that somehow being expressive in our love or being emotive in our love is antithetical to a true embrace of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we are grossly mistaken we are grossly mistaken so really in closing i pray that all of us who are married emerge from this conference with a renewed sense of purpose in our marriages. That it's not just to, you know, stay away from the haram or something like that. Rather, it's to open our hearts to love that liberates our hearts from the tyranny of our nafs. Jazakum wa khair wa alaikum.